One thing I can get into a little bit, if you want me to, is that uh, you've got the old mob mythology that they never did dope, but yeah. we all know that not the case. Even the New York families were running heroin. Wherever the money was the fastest, that's where they went. You are listening to Gangland Wire, hosted by former Kansas City Police Intelligence Unit Detective Gary Jenkins. Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. And I have an old friend of mine, many ways, we crossed paths many times, but we didn't really know each other. He worked with the guys that worked for me. I was a sergeant in the intelligence unit. So I kind of stayed out of the day-to-day -day activities and I had, you know, 12 guys that I was overseeing what everybody was doing. And, and so my guys worked with U.S. Attorney's Office and a particular FBI agent who was one of the best I ever met, Larry Tungate. And we have the U.S. Attorney, the Assistant U.S. Attorney that a lot of the guys worked with on several narcotics cases involving the mob in Kansas City, Chuck Ambrose. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you. Glad to be with you. It's great to have you and, and kind of get to know you. Like I said, I heard your name so many times from these guys, but somehow we just, our paths never cross, never met face to face. So it's really been good catching up with you before we started recording here. Some of the stories we're not going to tell on the air here. <laughs> you have been writing crime fiction and you have used your experience as a U.S. attorney here in Kansas City and other places a lot to create the storylines in these books. And it really sounds interesting. Chuck, why don't you name off some of those books? Okay. Well, the first I wrote, and just a little bit of background, I did several years in D.C. before moving to Kansas City. I'd come home every day and tell my wife what we'd been doing at work, and you can't make this stuff up. You ought to write a book. So I finally did. The first one published about 10 years ago now is Capital Kill, set in D.C., and it had to do with a Jamaican posse and a serial killer. And most of my books are based on either real cases or real investigations. Sometimes I will blend two or three into one novel. Often I will use actual court appearances and transcripts from my cases in those novels. And what I try to do is to write realism, to bring realism back into this field, because we've all seen the Hollywood overdone model with some guy snap shooting someone off a roof 200 yards away <laughs> with a handgun yeah. and outrunning machine gun fire and all that other ridiculous stuff. And I've gotten lots of positive feedbacks, both from prosecutors and from officers and agents who say, finally, someone's getting this right. And that's probably the most rewarding type of review that I get. I've gotten 2,000 plus reviews now on Amazon with the seven books, and they are all averaging four and a half stars or higher. The first book did actually go to number one in Amazon's Kindle store for mystery series novels. And then the fifth book that I have out of uh, uh, won an award in one of the trade magazines for general fiction book of the year. And the one that might interest you is the sixth in the series, based on the time I spent in Kansas City, mob rules <laughs> having to do with the outfit there yeah. in a very fictional sense. I understand. I understand. You were assistant U.S. attorney. The FBI had their one squad, their organized crime squad, and we had a 12 person complement in the intelligence unit and about six or seven of them worked a lot they worked all on organized crime but they worked a lot with the bureau and so you had the prosecutor's view of what everybody was doing both in the one squad and the other squads in the uh, fbi office that were working maybe some other kind of violent crime or working extortion or white collar crimes that mob guys will get their fingers in and narcotics too so that leads us to the question well you know historically they always said that the mob doesn't deal in narcotics, and we know that's not exactly true. And Nick Savella, who was the godfather or boss of the Kansas City family and had been since, gosh, the early 50s or middle 50s. We know by 57, he was at Appalachian. And so historically, supposedly did not approve of anybody dealing with narcotics, but you ran into some of that as a prosecutor. Is that not correct? Lots of it. Like you mentioned, that whole we don't do dope line was a public relations move, I think, by the mob as a whole. 
but the New York families were running heroin back in the 30s. Yeah. Capone and his mob, when alcohol was essentially an illegal drug, made their bones off of that. And what I ran into in Kansas City was a substantial amount of cocaine trade. And you mentioned Nick Savella. Well, in the Appalachian Conference in 57, he and his, his driver, his underboss at the time, Joe Filardo, are caught outside the con- conference in a cornfield wearing three-piece suits. And when the state police picked them up, they said, what are you doing out here? And they said, we're looking for women. (laughs) So the narcotics mythology is about as accurate as that was. And in fact, Joe Filardo's granddaughter, a gal named Vicky Vogliardo, married a mob wannabe by the name of Steve Vest. And in the early 90s, we had lots of people saying that they knew the vests were trading all kind of cocaine, but everybody was refusing to talk about them because they said, these guys will kill us. And you hear that a lot. And most of the time, it's an overblown threat. It turned out not to be the case with the Vest brothers. As a wedding present, the Filardo Vogliardo family gave Steve Vest a convenience store called the Roma Deli, which was attached in a common wall to the old Roma Bakery. And the only way that he was able to keep that afloat, not being a very good businessman, was to commit tons of food stamp fraud. And when we took that away from him in a Department of Agriculture investigation, he couldn't make it work anymore. So he burned it down. And unfortunately, for the people that had given him this business. It also took the Roma Bakery with it, the fire. He rolled the arson proceeds into a car wash out in Blue Springs. We ended up going up on four or five wiretaps at the same time. And when we did the initial round of indictments there, I think we indicted 28 or 30. One of the mid-level figures there spun, became a cooperating witness, And the next thing you know, we're investigating three homicides and on top of that, tremendous amount of cocaine trafficking. So both the mob members, the mob wannabes had their hands heavily into the cocaine trade in Kansas City, at least in the 90s. Yeah. Explain to the guys this food stamp fraud. I know what it is. And several of the corner stores, the mob associate owned corner stores out in the neighborhoods committed food stamp fraud. Tell the folks how that worked. Well, it can take two or three different forms. One of the more common ones is to accept food stamp fraud or food stamps for prohibited items like alcohol or cigarettes. The other things they would commonly do is buy up food stamps from the people who are getting them, paying 40 or 50 cents on the dollar, and then they would turn those in for payment as if they had been submitted for grocery purposes. And we had a Department of Agriculture undercover investigator that we ran in there several times and used that as a justification once we were able to document the illegal transactions for taking away the food stamp license from the Roma Deli. And then the next crime we uncovered was insurance fraud when they took the insurance claim on the arson they had said. They rolled that into the car wash out in Blue Springs, and then away we went. Now, you mentioned murders that they were involved in. There was one particularly gruesome double murder that these Vest brothers, it was Steve, and I can't remember the brother's name. There were four brothers involved in the case. Four of them, okay. Daryl was not involved in the homicide, but he was the main street dealer for the cocaine. The other three who were involved in the murders were Steve, Mark, and Jamie. And the usual business that they were conducting was to order 10 or 15 or 20 kilos at a time from an Arizona supplier. He would then send couriers up to deliver the coke. They would pay them once they got the coke, and then they would take the money back to Phoenix. On this last three, the Vest brothers decided that rather than pay the couriers, they would just kill them and save themselves the money that they would have otherwise had to pay for the two kilos of Coke on that one occasion. I think it was 10, 10 kilos. And so uh, the driver who usually drove the couriers to the Vest home to get paid, took them there. He was expecting to see them get paid again. And instead, the Vest brothers met them with drawn guns. 
these two Mexican couriers were handcuffed behind their backs. Their heads were wrapped in duct tape and they watched them suffocate. The bodies were then taken out into the woods north of the stadium complex. You have the old Washington and Lincoln cemeteries there off of Blue Ridge Cutoff. And they were buried in a shallow grave about 18 inches deep under an abandoned love seat in what had turned into kind of an illegal dump site. Mm -hmm. Once we learned of this, we were out digging the bodies up in a forensic anthropology sort of dig. Really? How did you get onto this? How did you undercover this? They have the turn that were part of the murders or how did they when we about that? When we went up on the wiretaps, we were able to recognize a lot of the drug conversations, but there were other conversations that were suspicious and kind of coded. Yeah. And we really didn't know what they were talking about, but we were able to spin a co-defendant named Arturo Gonzalez, who was basically one of the mid-level figures in the conspiracy. And he dropped the bomb on us in his first debriefing. We said, well, okay, Juan and Ernest, these guys who would drive the dope up to Kansas City, where are they now? They're dead. Well, how did that happen? Did they have a wreck going back to Phoenix? No, the Vest brothers killed them. And then he laid this story on us that he had actually seen this happen. And in fact, he had been instructed to help go bury the bodies so he knew where they were. Cool. And when we got the bodies back to the medical examiner's office, Frank Booth, who you probably remember from the crime lab and who was an excellent forensic specialist, saw that when we cut the duct tape off of the heads of these victims, there were carpet fibers trapped in the duct tape. We were then able to get search warrants for the vest home where this had occurred and were able to match those fibers to the living room carpet. Cool. And at the end of the proceedings, we never had to go to trial because all, all three of the homicide defendants pled guilty at the same time and all three received life without parole sentences. Yeah. So you had a witness and then you had forensic physical evidence that tied them to the murders. I mean, you just can't do any better than that, can you, Chuck? Like, no. bam, case closed. Yeah. That's really interesting. What about, like, they killed these two couriers. Did those couriers work for some cartel down in Mexico, or did they work for the Vest Brothers? And where were they from? Was there anybody that cared about them? You always hear about the cartel. If you double cross the cartel, they'll send, you know, Sicarios up and kill you and your family. So what about that? Did you get into any of that? We did. We were able to identify the figure that they had worked for. He had already died of natural causes. Now, we were able to find some family members of the two victims, and they came up and made victim impact statements at sentences. But as is often ha happens with suppliers who live in those border towns, there may be some structure of the cartel in that town itself, but most of the time it'll be across the border, like Nuevo Laredo or Juarez. And what you have essentially are lieutenants handling the in-state distribution. Okay. And so we were not able to climb the chain, at least within the U.S., for that particular system. Interesting. So I assume these Vest brothers, they didn't want to talk. And you probably didn't maybe care if they talked. You didn't really want to make a deal with them. Did you think about that? Did you approach them? Was there any made guys that they could bring into this? No, this was essentially Steve Vest's own side spin. And I think the actual mob members, including the Florados and the Roma Bakery families, were mad enough at him already for burning down their business to where they weren't going to bail him out very much. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Now, I remember that Vest Brothers deal. That was quite an investigation where everything came together perfectly. It was quite an investigation all those guys did. If I can mention one other thing about Frank Booth, it's nice to have guys like that on your side. I remember when we were taking the carpet that we got in the search warrant to the crime lab, which was then in downtown Kansas City, was before they moved out on Truce. Mm -hmm. We were going to take it to the usual loading dock that we would go to. And he said, no, don't take it to that one. Take it to the other side of the building. And we looked at him and said, why? And he said, the only defense theory that could ever hang this up is if we had fibers blowing around in the air conditioning. Uh, interesting. He said, 
that's a separate air conditioning unit on that side of the building. So if we take the carpeting in there and then seal a sample to go to the other side for analysis, they can't argue that we had airborne fibers coming through the duct work to contaminate the cage. <laughs> that guy had been down that path before where they raised that defense, I'm sure, out of his experience. That's interesting. Yeah, it is good to have people, thoughtful people like that to think of the difference. Yep. I told him, glad you're on our side. <laughs> <laughs> wonder if he retired and went to work for some white-collar crime defense attorneys. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> really? <laughs> went to work for hell free. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been interesting. Is there any more little side stories about that best case that you remember? Only that Daryl, the non-homicide defendant, was kind of on the fence about cooperating. And when we told him, you may be the straw that pushes your brothers into pleas. And that's the only way they're going to live because otherwise we're going to certify this as a capital case yeah. and seek the death penalty against all of them. And he ended up signing a cooperation agreement and we got notice of the pleas the day after that. Mm, interesting. Mark Vest had also killed a girl named Jill Lamar Shortly after sleeping with her, he found that there were a couple of kilos of cocaine in her closet. She was also a minor level drug pusher. She was holding them for somebody else. Mm. But rather than try to pay her, he decided he would do the same thing they had done with the two couriers. And he took her to one of the entries to Riverfront Park off of Front Street and put two bullets in the back of her head. And so that homicide was solved in addition to the two couriers. Wow just for the two kilos. What were these guys doing with their money? Did you find any cash hoards or were they investing in property or how were they washing their money? No, these were not financial geniuses. Steve <laughs> had his mind set on becoming a division one NASCAR stock racer. And so he was spending a lot of money on souped up engines and cars and things of that nature. But most of the time they were just doing the drug money thing and fast cars, women, and lots of expensive meals. Hmm. Interesting. They weren't gamblers. They go to Las Vegas. They drop a lot out there. I never got much evidence of that. I know they made one trip out there and spent a good bit of coin, but it was nothing like we saw with some of the other drug rings in Kansas City. I had one inner city drug defendant who... I can't remember the name. We went up on the wrong phone. We ended up on his gambling and social phone instead of this drug phone. <laughs> and we were able to document that he spent a quarter million in one weekend trip to Vegas at the crap tables and on his escorts. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. I've talked to another guy that's in witness protection now, and he was a marijuana smuggler, and he said he blew it all in Las Vegas, basically. And I talked to another guy yeah. who used to be a drug smuggler, who's written a book since then. And I said, well, how'd you wash your money? And he said, we just took it to Caesars, <laughs> Caesars Palace. And just this was kind of early before the CTRs were so important. He just, we'd take, right. you know, like a suitcase full of money and just deposit it with them. Then they'd give us credit, and then we could get chips or that we get our money paid back to us that way in a check. So it's yep. uh, it was a pretty good way to gamble, a pretty good way to wash money. Plus, those guys live on the edge anyhow. So you got yeah. several hundred thousand dollars in cash money. You don't know what to do with it. You know, you go out and gamble it and blow it. So what the heck? There's always more. And that's what this guy's in witness protection did. He said, I blew it all. <laughs> I'm just trying to gamble. Pretty common story. Yeah, interesting. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your Mob Rules book. Anybody who is familiar with the actual figures in town could probably make a fairly educated guess on who some of these characters are based on. Yeah. Now, guys, in Kansas City, we have several father and son yep. operations here, several of them. And so from the prosecutor's view and from my view too, is how the son sometimes follow the father's end of the business. And kind of interesting, just noticing with the passing of Willie Camasano Jr., his dad, Willie Ratz Camasano, was a made guy out of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and was a really important guy on the scene, on the streets, especially in Kansas City. And his son moved right up on into it. And his brother, Willie Camasano Jr.'s brother, Jerry Camasano, lives in Nick 
Alex Zabella's old house. So the Camisanos, this father and son relationship is quite common probably in other cities too. The Zabellas, their grandkids, their sons went into it. One son went into it. And then he had some boys, the grandsons of Cork and Nick. They didn't do so well because cocaine got them. One of them died just not too long ago, early age and just a health. Uh, unhealthy it, wreck of a man because right. of the cocaine use and the other brother is living in his mom's basement now so we have this tradition and there's several other families there's a mortina kid charlie mortina was a made guy back in the 50s and 60s and his son was part of willie jr Camasano's sports yes. book most recently and they copped a plea and did a little time and came back out. He runs a joint today in Kansas City. So go ahead and tell us about how did you incorporate that into your book? Kind of a little bit about the book. It's a theme that is not limited to the mob. When I was in D.C., one of the major cases I worked was a heroin deal. And the older generation of that family, if you can say that they any heroin dealer had done it right, they at least knew how to avoid detection. The older father figure there had been in business for 25 years and had never been caught. And the reason why is he just had a sixth sense almost about when the heat was turning up and when the shut down and he would shut down operations completely until he thought the coast was clear. Then he'd ramp back up again. And he was smart enough not to be flashy. He wasn't driving an expensive car. He wasn't spending exorbitant amounts of cash openly and was just a hard nut to crack, and we never did. But then he retired and turned the business over to his two knucklehead kids. And of course, they, not wanting to follow the wisdom of the older generation, violated every rule he set for them, started driving hot cars, spending money like it was going out of style. And we would see the same things in the differences in the mob to some extent in Kansas City, not that the older generation was as careful, but the younger guys seeing the faster money that the drugs were providing them couldn't avoid the temptation to spend it openly, drive the hot cars, have five dates on the same night with different women, all this crazy stuff. And so they were a lot easier to put the hands on. And the book, again, Bob Rules, Bob Rules yeah. the title itself is kind of an ironic thing. When you have an organization that has rules, those rules are in place. Some of them, as we mentioned, are more fiction when they say we are not doing drug trafficking. But they always seem to pay more attention to their own rules than society's rules or laws. And they take violations of those internal rules a lot more seriously. And that's a end thing to the book, of course. If you cross the mob, that's a whole different deal from breaking the laws. Of course, that's the business that they're in. When we were setting wires, and you probably have this experience too, I was always impressed at how hard the outfit guys worked at not working. <laughs> they spent more hours a day avoiding honest work than people who actually had a nine to five job. You see them sleep till noon, get up and have lunch somewhere with Vinny or Joe and plot some scheme that never comes to fruition. Then they go to an illegal gambling parlor because it's just beneath them to go to a legal casino, even though Kansas City had them by then. Yeah. Dinner's another meeting on another scheme that probably doesn't come to fruition. And then they're out all night at another after hours gambling joint till four in the morning. And then they do it all again the next day. And if they're really lucky, they might make 50 or 100 bucks on the lower level. And of course, half of that has to go upstream to the bosses. So it was a real education watching the avoidance of work as much as it was the actual work done on criminal schemes. So this relationship between, say, fathers and sons, how did you play that out in the book? I mean, the sons, sometimes they officially get inducted in to the family yeah. and or their associates for quite a while. And how right. does a father like give pieces of action or direct the son to criminal action activities or are they maybe given to another mob guy to kind of groom to bring along? Well, the father is always hoping that he can groom his son to be a made man and that he can follow the rules and bring what they call honor to that side of the family. And sometimes that works. Often it does not. 
And the book is basically about what happens when the son gets so out of control and is such an embarrassment to the mob itself that the father may end up even having to choose between the outfit and his own son. Oh, interesting. With some deadly consequences. Yeah. And I know one of these relationships that we're talking about is the son did bring a lot of embarrassment on the rest of the family for some of the things. He wasn't even making money. He was just angry and he was jealous. Yep. And he did a lot of things that got his name in the paper. And so did you put those kind of scenarios in there? That would be something. Yes. Young guys, they have a woman that rejects them. And so then they stalk her or they threaten her or things like that. You put those kinds of things in there because I know that's happened. I did. Yeah, I had to try a case like that. I'm impressed by prosecutors who say they have a 100% conviction rate. Mine was about 98% because there were a couple of cases I felt compelled to bring to trial that were very hard. Yeah. And one was an extortion case like that, which was essentially a he said, she said. And unfortunately, we ended up with, in my opinion, the wrong judge and a jury right before Christmas who didn't want to spend the time to do the hard work. And so after two or three votes, they acquitted and we all had to go home. But it was still a trial worth undertaking because it needed to be done. So that's the kind of the grist that you are pulling from to put in this mob rules book. It yes. sounds like interesting. Yeah, it sounds yep. like a really interesting look at mob in Kansas City, and especially you Kansas City fans out there. And you probably ought to get this book. And I think if you know anything about the mob in Kansas City, I'm representing. Them. I see you're going to recognize got a out of state Chiefs fan here. <laughs> So anyhow, that's really interesting. This has been a fascinating, Chuck, and I want to get you back sometime. And we've got the what we call the Young Italians case and got really kind of involved. I've got some sound bites from Larry Tungate. I need to sit down and go through those. And we'll go in more depth of what we call the Young Italians case where Chuck prosecuted the grandson of Willie Camisano, Willie Ratz. Yeah grandson on a multi-kilo deal and how that all came about. It's a really interesting story how it came all about. As we were talking just before, it's like any successful operation is like 90% work and 10% luck. <laughs> and, and so a lot of work went into it and then a little bit of luck happened at the end. And Detectives and investigators say I'd rather be lucky than good. And we were dealing with, as you mentioned, Larry Tongate, who has always been both. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard yeah. conversation. <laughs> Folks, this is an FBI agent that worked with my guys in the intelligence unit during the 90s on when after the Bureau was given the mandate to work on narcotics. They didn't work on yes. narcotics in the 60s, 70s, not until really the late 80s and then the 90s. And he was a guy that he was good. <laughs> and he was the hardest working man in show business, just like James Brown. I'm telling you, he was good. I really enjoyed was. working with Larry. Yep. All right. Chuck, I really appreciate you coming on, and we will be in touch to do another show pretty soon. And remember, you guys, I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're out there on the street. And if you have a problem with PTSD or you have a friend or a relative that has a problem with PTSD and they've been in the service, then you can go to the VA website and get that hotline, and there's help available for you out there. So thanks a lot, Chuck, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you, Gary.